All right. Father, we are thankful for missionaries, and Lord, we support a bunch of them here out of this church, and we're thankful for the ability to give above and beyond our means because we can never outgive you. You say that as we give, so we receive. And so I just pray each and every dollar that goes to these missionaries, that actually goes to them, it doesn't get wrapped up in bureaucracy or red tape, it gets into the hands of our missionaries, that you would bless them and that you would help them to have a fruitful ministry wherever they are around this world. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So as you're receiving the missions offering, I had mentioned last week when we talked about the power of the tongue that we were going to have testimonies because I challenged everybody to go 24 hours without saying anything bad about anybody. And I said, we're going to have some testimonies about that this week. So who's ready to give a little testimony of what happened this week when you went 24 hours without saying anything bad about anybody? Well, I'm going to give a testimony. I decided that I was going to hit it strong Monday, get it done, get it out of the way. Ooh, really strong. And I made it 30 minutes. 30 minutes I made it, and it was horrible. And so, yeah, and uh, I tried a couple other days and made it a little bit longer. But what a tough thing that is, right? When you, all of a sudden you become hyper aware of everything you say, and it's really hard. Anybody else? You gave it a try? All right. So um, we're going to talk again about James. Um, but we'll, before we get into that, I just, you know, somebody sent out this big email and had this whole list of funny things. And I just took a couple of them because I thought they were hilarious. Um, when one door closes, another one opens, you're probably in jail. <laughs> and if you've never been, I used to do prison ministry, so it's hilarious because that's exactly what happens. You open a door and you hear this big clonk, you open the door, and then clonk, it clonks behind you, and then clonk, the other one opens and you can open it, and then clonk, it always, and so that's so true. When one door opens, another one closes, you're in jail. Um, 60 might be the new 40, but 9 p.m. is the new midnight. I can totally identify with that one. Totally identify with that one. Um, when I say the other day, I could be referring to any time between yesterday and 15 years ago. And that's so true, too. I'm like, just the other day that happened. It's like, when? Was that last week? No, like 15 years ago. Um, I remember being able to get up without making sound effects. <laughs> Darlene, Nick's name, he's Mr. Grunty. Because, um, you know, I remember playing with the kids on the floor and everything. And I used to spring right up and do whatever you do. And now it's kind of like... Roll over on my side, sit up, get on all fours, slowly stand up with the help of a chair. And, uh, and then the last one is, is I tested, uh, no, I had my patients tested, and I'm negative. <laughs> so, so true. So, you know, we've been looking at all these different things. We looked at joy, and we looked at mercy, and we looked at the power of the tongue, and we looked at all these different things out of James, which are great resolutions and, and we find out that they're not that easy right because i mean just look at like trying to control the power of the tongue where james said that if anybody could actually do that that person would be perfect or or mature and i would like to think of myself as mature but then when i try to control my words i find out maybe i'm not that mature if that is a standard of maturity so today we're going to look at um humility and pride and such a big big topic so Let's, uh, let's jump right in here to James chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. He gives greater grace, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud. And let me just stop right there, because a lot of times people are like, you know, oh, the world is against me, or Satan's after me. Sometimes you might want to do an evaluation, because sometimes God is opposed. God is against the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. So we have this introduction of these two concepts, which are more than like traits. They're literally, we're going to see today that they're more than their, you know, traits or, or you know, um, they're at, even more than attitudes. They're actually two natures that are diametrically opposed to one another that are reflected in the great battle of the cosmos. They're two natures. And then he goes in verse 7 which, you know, almost seems out of place because he's talking about humility and pride. And then in verse 7, he says, Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I've always wondered, like, why is he talking about pride and humility? And then he uses submit to God, resist the devil. He brings in these two characters, these two beings, and we're going to look at this and how it unfolds this morning. And then a little bit later in James 4, verse 10, again, he says, humble yourselves. And this is a key. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So humility isn't something necessarily that, that, that God does to us or for us. It's something that we have to do 
in ourselves. And so pride, humility, two natures. So first of all, let's look at the nature of Satan. We're going to look at Satan's pride because this is the very nature of Satan. We're going to go back to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he's talking about this spiritual being. He's talking about Lucifer, who was an archangel created majestically and beautifully. And, and this is what he says in Isaiah 14. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And so this is, this is God speaking about Lucifer during his fall. And, and, and look at all the I statements, right? Because what's the middle letter of, of pride? It's I. What's the middle letter of sin? It's I. Years ago, the Beatles wrote a song, I, me, me, mine. Right. And, and, and that's what it's all, you know, I, me, me, mine. It's all about me. And, and this is that nature. This is a nature of Satan. This is so huge because it's literally the nature of Satan. Five times you hear the word I, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to raise my throne up here. I'm going to be like God. And that's a nature that says, I don't want to be subservient. I don't want to be submissive to, I'm going to be my own God. And this is the nature of pride. And it's a control thing. I am going to control my destiny. I'm going to control my life. And so heaven's archangel, heaven's worship leader, corrupts his own nature and poisons his own nature because of this pride. Because you see, all of creation is meant to be subservient to God. It's his creation. And we're dependent on him. On everything. We depend on him for the breath we breathe. We depend on him for the next heartbeat in our lungs. We depend on him on our food. We depend on him for everything that we have. But pride becomes the root, literally, of all sin. It is the taproot of all sin. It turns angels into demons. It's what poisoned Adam and Eve in the garden. You can be like God. You don't have to follow his rules. You don't have to play by his rules. You can be God. So when we look at the world and we live in, all the wars, all the suffering, all the jealousies, all the bitterness, all the addictions, all comes from this nature of hell, this nature of pride that has entered into the entire human family, and we have it now by nature. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for by nature, naturally, we have become children of wrath. By nature, it's in us. I don't need God. I don't want God. I don't, I, I'm going to have my own way, right? We see this in like, like little babies, right? They stiffen up and wah, right? they want their own way. And they get to that nature where it's like, you know, when they when they get two or it's my toy or, you know, they they start getting this thing that just comes out of them naturally. And I love it when people say, well, I was born this way, you know, whatever it might be. I was born this way. Well, of course you were. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. You've got to be born out of what you were born into naturally, which was a fallen nature of pride. And uh, that's why Jesus said it's so important that we be born again. So I want to go back and review some things that we looked at uh, at part three in, in week three. Um, again, because it gets to this nature of I'm going to control my own life. I'm going to do what I want, how I want, when I want, where I want. All of this, me, it's all about me. So we go back to Genesis chapter four. And it says this, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. And that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It comes about, it just comes about in time that Cain brings an offering to the Lord. And we would say, wow, he's acknowledging God, right? So, I mean, he heard from Adam and Eve what, what was going down. You know, his, his parents were the ones that, you know, tripped up and fell into sin. And by that, we've all now inherited this nature of the fallen one who deceived them in his rebellion and in his fall against God. And so, so he brings this offering of the fruit of the ground. 
But Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions, and the Lord had regard to Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. A lot of theologians believe that Cain and Abel were twins. Because when you read the Genesis story, it says Eve conceived, and there was Cain and Abel. And then it's not until you get to chapter 5, it says, and she conceived again and had Seth. And so there's this belief that Cain and Abel were probably twins. And, and here's this, you know, usually twins are really bonded. There's like a, a connection with twins. But here's this animosity, this hatred where, 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 where he's so angry, where, you know, he's so angry that his offering wasn't accepted, that Cain's offering wasn't accepted. And yet he should have known. Right? Adam and Eve, what was one of the first things they did when they, when they realized they had fallen away from the nature of God and the glory of God and now have this new nature of sin and shame and blame? The first thing they tried to do was hide themselves. And then they start blaming everybody. It's the woman. It wasn't the woman. It's a snake. And you know, on and on. And now we're going to blame everything because of this pride, we're going to defend ourselves. But Adam and Eve had already tried that. Adam and Eve had already tried covering themselves with leaves which is the produce of the ground, and that didn't work. God covered them with skins, which represented an animal sacrifice where blood had to have been shed. And so they must have shared this with their sons. This is the way you approach God. It's a blood sacrifice because a life has to be given for sin. Now, we know that in Hebrews it says that by faith, Abel offered a more better, a better sacrifice, a more acceptable sacrifice. Well, where did he get the faith? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so he would have heard from Adam and Eve what God's standards was, what God's approach was, what God's protocol was. This is how you come into God's presence. The Bible is very clear that this is how God says we approach him. And, and, and so this pride thing says, I'll do it my way. Now you see it all the time, right? And we see this reflected as it unfolds in Scripture. The prophet Ezekiel said, The person who sins will surely die. And we know that God told that to Adam. When the day that you sin, you will die. And literally in the Hebrew it says, Dying, you will die. So spiritually, he died the minute he disobeyed God. But it took him another 900 years before it physically caught up with him. But dying spiritually, you will surely die physically. And so it goes on in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you for the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is by the blood, by reason of the life that makes atonement. And so uh, there's got to be an innocent life given for the guilty. There's got to be a covering. There's got to be a payment because God is holy and God demands a recompense for man's sin. It, God doesn't just turn a blind eye to it and say, yeah, pff, I forgive you guys. It's just a big mistake. Let's just put it behind us. No, there's got to be penalty. There's got to be justice. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a fair God or a just God. And then finally, we get to Hebrews 9.22, and it says, According to the law, one may almost say that all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. He said blood. He didn't say sap, right? He didn't say, like, you know, the stuff that's in trees and plants and things like that. And so um, th this, is, this is what happens in, Matthew, in, in uh, Mark chapter 11, when we have the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree. What happens there? Jesus comes up to a fig tree expecting to find figs for food, and it's got nothing but leaves. And he curses it, and it dies. It withers from the roots and dies. And what did Jesus say? How did Jesus curse it? With words. He said, no man will ever eat from you again. And the symbolism and the typology that's taking place there is that Israel is a lot of times in Scripture referred to as the fig tree. And basically, Jesus is saying, I've come to the nation of Israel who had the oracles of God and the prophets of God and the priesthood and all these things looking for fruit. But instead, all I find are the leaves of religiosity. You've got all this stuff, but it's nothing more than a religion. You've got the law, but the law can only convict of sin, and which, which gives you a sentence of, of condemnation and death. The law can't bring life. Religion can't bring life. Listen, we know we're condemned. We know that we have a sentence of death over our heads because of our sinfulness. But there's nothing that can bring life. The only thing that could bring life was a blood sacrifice 
that would appease and be the propitiation towards God's holiness and his justice and the demands of his wrath that would enable us now to receive life. You must be born again. You've got to enter into this relationship with Christ where there's a new genesis of life that comes into you and you're born again. There's a new identity that happens where I'm shifting away from the old nature to the new nature. I'm putting off the new man. I'm putting on the new man, uh, the, the old man. I'm putting on the new man created in righteousness. I'm putting off pride and I'm coming to God the way God says to come to him through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because Jesus said, no man comes to the Father unless they come through me. Religion doesn't do it. Religion will never do it. And I don't care what the religious name tag is. You've got to be born again. And that's by submitting, humbling, coming to God the way God says. And now we can receive this gift of life. And now we can be born again. And so we looked at Satan's pride, right? Satan is like, I'm going to do this my way. I don't need to be subservient to God. Heck, I'll be God. I will raise my throne. I will be like God. Now let's look at the other demonstration of the humility of Jesus. We see, this, we see the pride of Satan. Let's look at the humility of Jesus. One of the first things we see is in the temptations of Jesus. Right when Jesus starts his public ministry, the first thing that happens is Satan takes him and tempts him for 40 days. And all of those temptations were primarily about one thing, to get Jesus to act without dependency on God. Like Jesus... You can turn the stones into bread. You you can do it. Jesus, you can throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and not be hurt. You can do these things independent. You don't have to check in with the big guy upstairs. You don't have to. You can just do this yourself. All those temptations where you get him to act independently without God. And then we get to Philippians chapter 2, and it says this. Have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. You know, there's a lot of times I go on Facebook and I see these funny memes about attitude. Like, I've got a bit, you know, i got an attitude and, you know, and we make fun of attitude. And, and, and God doesn't tell us to have attitude. He says, have this attitude. He says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's the reflection of a nature. One, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, a nature of pride. Everything, everything that comes out of him, emanates from him, is pride. Everything that comes out of the attitude of Jesus is humility. Have this attitude, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he's of the very nature of God, the very essence of God, the very substance of God, because he's part of the Trinity. He is part of the Godhead. He's one with God, one God in three persons. Uh, he did not regard that equality with God a thing to be grasped in other words he didn't come to the earth and say hey I'm God and this is what's going down from here on out you're all going to do what I say and how he didn't do that he didn't but but rather it says he emptied himself and in the Greek it's the word kinesis this is what's called the great kinesis of Christ where although he is God in the flesh He empties himself of some of those things, some of those attributes. What are some of the attributes he emptied himself? Omnipotence, all-powerful. He fell asleep in the boat. He understood what it meant to get wearied and tired. Uh, Omnipresence, God's everywhere all the time. Jesus limited himself. If he was in Jerusalem, he wasn't in Samaria. If he was in Samaria, he wasn't in Capernaum, right? So all of these different things. He, you know, he didn't empty himself of his holiness or of his deity or of all these things, but he emptied himself. And look at what it says. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. He, he humbled himself. Again, this is something we have to do. God not, doesn't do it for us. He humbled himself. That was a choice he was making. Boy, I'm a big fan about choice. I'm reading a book right now, and it's Calvinistic theology, election, predestination, and I just can't buy that for anything. I just can't believe that God says who's going to go to hell and who's going to go to heaven. I I can't believe that. Because if that's what really happens, then there's people going to hell unjustly because they were already damned before they were even born. And, And how unjust is that? But emptying himself, he humbled himself, became obedient. I want to be obedient to the point of death. 
even death on the cross. Holy smokes. So does this unpack itself in the life of Jesus? You betcha. Let's just go through a couple of chapters in the Gospel of John. John 5, 19, the Son can do nothing of himself. I'm not going to do anything on my own. I'm humbly here to obey the Father. 5.30, I don't seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I'm not here doing my own thing. Verse 41, I do not receive glory from men. No pride. I'm not, I'm not looking for accolades. I'm looking for, not looking for pats on the back, right? Chapter 6, verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John chapter 7, verse 16, my teaching is not my own, but him who sent me. Verse 28, I have come not of myself, but he who sent me is true. Verse 50 in chapter 8, I do not seek my own glory. Again and again and again, Jesus is emptying himself, not demanding anything, only being obedient to the will of the Father. Doesn't do anything outside of the will of the, of the, of the Father. And doesn't do anything outside of the enabling of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't do anything as the Son of God. He doesn't heal the sick as the Son of God. He doesn't cleanse the leper as the Son of God. He doesn't open blind eyes as the Son of God. He doesn't raise the dead as the Son of God. He does it all through the power of the Holy Spirit. His dependency is on obedience to the Father and the ability of the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, what I do, you can do also because I go to the Father. That we can be dependent on the Holy Spirit also. So you see that there's this, this aspect of humility that incorporates this concept that you find in Scripture of brokenness. That God delights in broken things. That God uses broken things. Now here's a hope for fallen humanity because we're all broken. We are, we're all broken. We all have things, right? There's so many broken lives. There's so many broken hearts. There's so many broken dreams. There's so many broken hopes. So many broken visions. And so we get broken. But God uses broken things, right? Moses, go to Horeb and there's a rock there. And when you strike the rock, it will break and split and out of it will flow water to, to, to nourish the three million people that came out of Egypt. Gideon, take these jars and put the lamps inside the pitchers and when you charge down, smash them, break them and the light will shine and it'll confuse the enemy. Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and blesses it and begins to feed 5,000 people. The woman with the alabaster jar of perfume comes into the presence of Jesus and breaks it, breaks its seal in order for the fragrance to fill the room, to anoint Jesus in preparation for his death and burial. God delights, and there's so many more illustrations in Scripture about God uses brokenness. God delights in using broken things and in broken people whose will and ways are broken before Him. In other words, we just get to a point where we say, I'm done of trying to do things in my own way. I'm done of trying to do this on my own. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to surrender. That's what brokenness is. That's why a lot of times in worship, we lift our hands because it's the international sign of surrender. It's like, God, I honor you. I glorify you. I surrender before you. I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I can't do it on my own. I'm a failure. I always will be because there's something in me by nature that wants to lean over to pride in my own way and get my own way. We look at the life of Jacob. The very name Jacob means supplanter, deceiver, trickster, cheater. We find that Jacob cheats his brother Esau out of his birthright. We find that he does it by deceiving his blind father and making his father think that he is Isaac and getting the blessing. We find later on that he tries to deceive his own father-in-law, Haman. And then when he has to return to Isaac... And Isaac has 400 soldiers ready to wipe him out and kill him and just take everything that he's got. He has this wrestling match with the angel of the Lord. Most theologians believe it's a pre-incarnate picture of Jesus, a theophany, a pre-incarnate picture of Jesus. And he's wrestling with this angel of the Lord. And he's like, bless me, bless me. And the angel says, what's your name? And he says, Jacob. And he goes, from now on, you're going to be called Israel. And he smites him in the hip and puts out his hip socket and destroys the sinew in his hip socket. And what happens? He becomes Israel, a prince with God, but his walk is changed. 
He no longer walks the way he used to. He walks now with a limp. His walk was changed. And here's where we humble ourselves and God changes our walk. We don't walk with that strutting, you know, arrogance. We walk humbly before God. This is what God looks for us to do, is to walk humbly before him. And when he comes out that way, here's Isaac ready to destroy him. But when Isaac sees him broken, humbled, limping, what does he do? He rushes out and embraces him, kisses him, and they cry together. And he forgives him of all the sin that had taken place. We look at David. David was a king. David was a monarch. In this culture, kings could do anything. And David did do anything, right? He had an adulterous affair with a married woman. He just saw her. He wanted her. He's the king. He took her. And then, and then she got pregnant. Got to hide that up. So he has her husband sent off into combat and has him killed. And the prophet Nathan comes and points his finger in David's faith. And he says, you are that man. You're the one that did this. And he's convicted and he's humbled. And he later writes the words in Psalms 51. For you do not delight in sacrifice. You don't want leaves. Otherwise, I'd give it. You're not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Has your heart ever been broken? Have you ever allowed God to bring you to that place where you're broken? You're that lump of clay on the wheel where he's going to start forming and fashioning. We look, at, we look at Peter, right? Peter, whoa, whoa, boy, he's the vocal one. He's the brazen one. He's the one that draws a sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant when they come to arrest Jesus. He's the one that tells Jesus, you know, you're not going to wash my feet. He's the one that tells Jesus, I'm never going to deny you. And Jesus says, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. And then all of a sudden that happens and he goes out and he weeps bitterly. He's broken. And then he writes this later on one of his epistles, 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourself. And there it is again. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in proper time. It's not that God wants us to grovel in the dust. It's just that when we come to him with a broken and contrite spirit, when we allow him to work in our lives, sometimes it's painful because he brings, he brings things to death in us. And the things that he wants to bring to death in us is that pride. It's so evasive and so slippery and so deceptive. And he brings that. And we have the story of the publican or the tax gatherer, and he's praying in the presence of God, and there's a Pharisee, a priest, and the Pharisee's like looking at him like, hey, God, I thank you. I thank you that I'm not like that guy. And here's religion. We're judging each other on the curve, right? I can't be that bad because, I mean, look at the world. Look at that guy. I'm not that bad. But that guy in Luke 18, 13, the tax collector standing a distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Look what he said. He didn't say, be merciful to me, a sinner. Like, I'm judging on the curb. I'm looking at everybody, and I'm a sinner too. We're all sinners, but you know. No, he says, be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm not just a sinner. I am the sinner. Like Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. Like the older you get, the more it just creeps in on you that, wow, there is an issue that we have. There's got to become a personal ownership. You know, sometimes we look at Adam and Eve and we say, how could they have been in the garden with God, seeing all the things that God has provided, being in his presence and his fellowship, and still disobey his word and believe the lies of the enemy? And yet you and I would fall a hundred times faster. Every one of us, if we were put in that scenario, would fall. We look at the Apostle Paul. Wow. What a great guy Paul was. Look what he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. That's quite a resume right there. That will open doors for you. But he doesn't stop there. 
he goes on and he says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted for loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. Oh, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, a, a Pharisee, blameless under the law. I got it together. All that stuff is rubbish. And actually, the Greek word is dung. It's poop. All that stuff that most people glory in and look at me is poop. Refuse. I would much rather have the higher calling of knowing Jesus. That's all that matters is knowing Jesus. I remember reading an article years ago of this, um, this well-known, you know, actually globally known minister of the gospel. Highly, highly educated person. Had multiple doctorate degrees. Not just a doctorate degree. Had multiple doctorate degrees. And it was a great preacher. And he died. And after he died, they were going through his office and his books and his library and his filing cabinets and in his filing cabinets they found under d a file that said dung and they went in there and there were all his degrees there were all his certificates like paul he was saying it's just dumb one of the most brilliant minds of of, of probably you know the fourth century was thomas akempis just a genius brilliance and he said my knowledge is but straw in the knowledge of god just just pride versus humility and then we look at jesus and when we look at jesus we go back to philippians 2 8 he humbled himself by becoming obedient and man there 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 it is right there how do we humble ourselves? By becoming obedient to the point of death? Well, yeah, we have to die to pride. We have to come to God the way God says. We have to humble ourselves and die to ourselves and come to God the way God says. Jesus said, unless you humble yourself like a little kid, you're not going to make it in the kingdom of heaven. And little kids are just gullible. They're going to do whatever you know, mom and dad say. So dad's saying, go to the cross. That's the way you get into heaven. So we humble ourselves and we go to the cross. We die to our own self so that we might gain Christ and that we might know Christ. You know, medical profession tells us that around the heart is a sac, a membrane called the pericardium. The pericardium encompasses the heart. It's a sac. And when a heart ruptures, like it literally ruptures, that sac is filled with a clear serum. So when the soldier pierced the chest cavity of Jesus and withdrew his javelin, and the Bible says, out came water and blood, it meant that that pericardium membrane sac was revealing that Jesus' heart literally ruptured. He didn't bleed out. He didn't die of exhaustion. He literally died of a broken heart. And when we think about this great message, when we think about this greatest story ever told, that there is salvation for mankind, that that salvation didn't come from a great victory or a military conquest. No, it came through brokenness. It came through brokenness. Now, Jesus is going to come back a second time, and there will be a cleansing. There is going to be a military conquest. He is going to come back with a a, a, a sword coming out of his mouth and going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. We look forward to that day. But right now, we live in this time of humility and brokenness and looking to God. There's broken people all over the place. And just being broken doesn't necessarily mean humility. Because brokenness affects different people different ways. The Old Testament said, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Paul talks about this in Romans 11, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And when we read that, it kind of goes back to like this election thing, like, wow, what, what chance did Pharaoh have if God was the one that hardened his heart? 
But we need to understand and we need to remember that in the Hebrew language, there is this thing called permissive verbs, which we don't even have in our language. Which means that a lot of times when it says God did this, it means God allowed that. God allowed it. Because we find other verses in the scripture that says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So what really happened? Well, it's not what God does necessarily. It's what God reveals. So when life is hard and life is harsh and we get broken and we get wounded and we get hurt and we get fractured, some people are broken by that and they look for God. And other people get angry and they get mad at God. You see, it's not God any more than a piece of butter in the sun is softened and a piece of clay is hardened. It's not the sun that's doing it to them. The sun is just revealing what the character is and what the makeup is of each substance. The butter softens, the clay hardens. Some people's hearts, when they get crushed, hurt, wounded, they don't get broken. They don't humble themselves. They get angry. I remember talking to a person on the phone. Somebody in the church called me up and said, hey, I'm down here in a different state. I think it was Arizona or something. And my buddy's here. Would you talk to him? And there was no talking to that guy. That guy was angry at God. And the more I would talk about God and bring God up, the angrier he got. It wasn't, wasn't God that was doing that to him. God was just simply like the sun shining on him. And his heart was getting hard. And that's why again and again and again, it says Jesus humbled himself and all these scriptures say humble yourself it's a choice that we make that we say god i don't want the things of life uh, to harden me i want to be soft i want to be humble i want to be pliable before you micah in the old testament says this sums it up great he has told you O man what is good and what does the lord require of you but to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Boy, that sums it up right there. Love justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before God. James says that God gives greater grace. This is huge. God gives greater grace because humility is never the fruit of sorrow over our sin. Humility comes from recognizing the goodness of God's grace. It's not condemnation that leads us to repentance. The Bible says it's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not about, oh, I got caught sin, being, being sinful and, and, you know, I, I'm sorrowful. No, I'm, I, I got basked and, and, and healed and, and, and melted in the presence of God's overwhelming love. And that's where humility comes from, is just living in that new nature, that nature that Jesus gives us, that nature that humility is now ours. And, and it's a flag of victory. It's not a sign of defeat. It's a flag of victory. And that's why he said, submit to God. God is opposed to the proud. God exalts the humble. Therefore, submit to God. When life is doing things to you and you think it's unfair, just submit to God. And let him have his way and resist the devil. Resist that hardening process that I'm angry at God. Why did God do this and why did God do that? I've met so many people angry at God. Why, why did this happen? Why did I lose this child? Why did I get cancer? Why did, my, why did I lose my job? All these different things. Angry, angry at God. Well, you know, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. That's life. And some it hardens and some it softens. And God is saying, listen, let it soften you in humility. And recognize you don't have control. It's a big thing for men here today. Because men have a desire to control. That's why men struggle with anger issues. Because anger is nothing more than the inability to control. We want to control things outside of you know everything. And you just simply can't. This life is too messy to be controlled by anybody. It's, it's, too, it's too crazy. And so we just humble ourselves before God, and God begins to exalt us. 
and we begin to grow in the knowledge of Christ. How do I submit to God? Through brokenness, through humility. We used to sing that song, Have Your Way, God, Have Your Own Way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you exalt the humble and then you give us and show us how we can humble ourselves. And so it just behooves us in this journey of life to humble ourselves before you so that you can exalt us and exalt us in a way that leads to total submission and total dependence on you as our creator, our God, and our redeemer. Because after all, you are a good God. Yes, you're holy. Yes, you're just. But you're good and you're merciful and you're kind. And we're so thankful that in your love, you cause us to want to hunger after you. And Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning that's going through things that are, that's outside of their control. And, and, and it might be angering them and it might be causing them to question. It might even be causing them to stumble and their faith is wavering a little bit. But God, I pray you'd come alongside of them and just say, hey, this is a great time to just humble yourself before me and I'll exalt you in due time. I will exalt you because you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you. And yeah, there might be a broken process that's going on in your life, but it's only to break that nature of pride away from you so that you can live in the nature of Jesus, which is humility. And Lord, we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen, amen. Hey, go this week and walk in a nature of humility before God.